All right. So hopefully everybody had a great Valentine's Day, and uh, welcome to our latest culinary history podcast. Uh, we are mixing up the formula today, try to get a better formula going. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we're going to start with uh, some birthdays and inventions uh, in this past week in culinary history. Starting with last Tuesday, one week ago today, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service began life in uh, 1871. It was originally called the U.S. Commission on Fish and Fisheries. And the reason this is culinarily related is because it was created to study and recommend solutions to the decline in the stocks of food fish. So happy 150 years, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. And as we know, the decline in uh, food fish was mostly due to overfishing. Yeah. But, um, so they also regulate, right, how much you're allowed to fish. Yeah, how much you are. And that's why fish you need fishing licenses. And, yeah, fishing which license makes sense. And stuff like that. If so. everyone, if everyone just fishes. Population yep. goes down. Population goes down, and now it's, you know, regulated, and it's on the rise. It's actually really on the rise this year. Um, the but fish that's, population? Or? Well, yeah, but that's, you know, oh, yeah, cause the latest. No one's, no going, one's going fishing. <laughs> no one's leaving their homes, so no one's going fishing. In fact, while I was doing the research for this episode, there was big old, please buy some fishing licenses, people. Yeah. We might uh, actually have a population boom that needs to be um, fished uh, yeah. next year. Oh, well, this because year. it's oh. the similar reason to why there were it was dolphins, right? Yeah. They're back in the canals yep. in Venice. The dolphins in the canals in Venice. Yeah, because no one was in the canals. No one was there. They were like, oh, hey, cool. Free canals. Yeah. We can just roam around. Um, in 1894, on the 9th of February, Hershey's Chocolate Company was founded as a subsidiary of Milton S. Hershey's Lancaster Caramel Company. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, he did not originally make It started chocolates. with caramel? It started with caramels. Hmm. Um, was caramel more popular? Apparently? I don't know. He started with caramels, and then in 1900, only a few years after that, he sold the assets of his caramel business, believing caramels to be a fad, and oh. he uh, sold them to the American Caramel Company, switching his focus purely to chocolates. Now, he, so, yeah, he, he might have wasn't. been right. Caramels might have been incredibly popular for a while. Because yeah. the uh, American Caramel Company was uh, incredibly popular after Are they Milton. still in business? No, they are not. Mm. Uh, they went out of business in the 20s, I believe. Oh, so, the 20s? Yeah. So wow. it was like, it was a, there was a brief time where caramels were incredibly popular. And these days, you don't see a lot of just, you know, caramel candy. No, it's well, you got, harder to find caramel. Uh, well, not harder to find, but... It's not harder. You get, it's you get not, the Yeah, it's not as popular. There it's are not, not as many. There just isn't a market for as many versus chocolate. Like, could have a whole aisle. Yeah. The, the most caramels you find are caramel in chocolate. Yeah. Which makes me wonder if he bought back some of his old uh, caramel-making stuff when they started to go down and was like, I'm going to put it in chocolates now. I don't know. Oh, yeah, Hershey's does have a caramel syrup for ice cream. Yeah. And a strawberry syrup for ice cream. I don't know what other caramel stuff they make. Um, Not sponsored, by the way. In, well, we <laughs> never are. We, we talk about a lot of, this is, this is the people Very that true. are, that were invented in this, well, last week, this day. Yeah. Uh, well, that, no. At this time, last week, over a hundred years ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just try to, try to run that through your brain. Um... Yeah, don't they do Milky Way? Isn't that Hershey's? Or is that Nestle? Uh, don't know. I don't know. I'm sure they have, like, some... I don't know. Caramel, in the middle, uh, candy. I know they... I'm sure they do. I'm sure. Th th there's gotta be at least one. I'd have to look that up. I don't know who makes the Milky Way bar. <laughs> it might be. It might be them. And you thought we were done with the, uh... Sugar talk? Well, no, folks. There's a reason I called this uh, post-Valentine's Day sweetness. Uh, in 1846, on the 10th of February, Ira Ramson a, uh, was born. He was a chemist, and he was the second president of John Hopkins University. 
he was the co-discoverer of the artificial sweetener saccharin in 1876. Uh, saccharin is the oldest low-calorie sweetener approved for use today, and the um, oldest non-caloric uh, sweetener ever. His lab assistant, uh, this is how they discover it, tasted an odd sweetness on his rolls after working with some chemicals in the lab with him. And since this was the 1870s and only surgeons uh, really washed their hands that often, it actually was just catching on for surgeons in the 1870s to wash their hands before doing surgery and whatnot. Everyone else, you know, never did it. Yeah. So he tasted it on his rolls and his wife didn't. I'm surprised chemists didn't think of it at around the same time. You... You'd think, but it took a long time to uh, really build up. It wasn't until, uh, I believe it said, the 1970s that hand-washing really became popular the among 1970s? the masses. 1970s? 1970s. That surprised wow. me, too. I yeah. might need to go back and do that research I again. Thought, but you would have thought earlier than that. I, I would have thought 20s or earlier. Hand well, you got to think, hand washing I mean, relies there were on sinks, clean running water. But there in were large indoor bathrooms spots. in the twenties. There were in and sinks. major cities. In major cities, yeah. Right. So, <clears throat> but to the masses, they were not actually that. Uh, I would have thought when she had indoor running. running water, hand washing would have been soon after. You'd think, but. but it, I guess that's just me. Hand washing, no. Dishwashing, yes. You know, cleaning off, stuff like that. Doing your laundry and stuff like that. Yeah, so wouldn't you think your hands? You'd I, think, you, but no. The 70s? No one, no one. Now all the um, ads that are still going around mm -hmm. make sense. Like, even before um, the thing that shall not be named, we had hand washing ads and I always wondered like who was not washing their hands but if it only gained popularity in the 1970s that makes so much more sense yeah um they, they might have been doing it person by person uh but according to National Geographic it wasn't until the 1980s that hand hygiene was officially incorporated into American healthcare with the first national hand hygiene guidelines wow so yeah, wow, I mean, that's interesting. Pe people might have been, you know, sort of doing it like, oh, this is, you know, a little splash a bit of water on your hands. Clean them off when you're coming in from uh, cleaning yeah. stuff. But that wouldn't clean off, you know, harsh chemicals like what he was working with. No. Well, now two chemists wear gloves. Yeah. And wash their hands. Yeah. Um, but, you know, back in those days, they didn't have no, they probably didn't those kinds of gloves, gloves back then. Because, no, you... you you know, you don't want to be touching this, and, and chemists understand what to touch cool. with their skin and not touch with their skin. Yeah. So they wear gloves, and also to, even after you've washed your hands, touching things can mm -hmm. influence the experiment. Yeah. Because, you know, we've got sweat, oil, yep. stuff. All that stuff that contaminates the Yeah, it contaminates the what you're doing. So it's, sometimes it's not even to protect you, it's to protect the experiment. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the, uh, wow, the lab the assistant. the 80s? The 80s. The well, lab assistant now came Now all in. those ads make sense. The lab assistant came in the next day and was like, hey, I, I, I found this out. Let's find a way to, you know, do it on purpose. <laughs> and uh, they made the, uh, the sweetener. So happy birthday, Ira Ramson. Hmm. Um, Does it have a brand name? No. No? Uh, Saccharin, um, not Doesn't really. Know no, not that I could find. Because I've often wondered how many are on the market and how many are that but branded. Yeah, it's not super used these days. And oh, it's, it's, gone um, it, it's sort of gone out of style. It's still occasionally used. Uh, but it's also mixed with other chemical sweeteners. And um, there, there's probably a few brands of it, but they're mm -hmm. lesser known. It's not any of the big ones like uh, Splenda or Stevia or anything like that. Well, Stevia is a plant. Yeah, but, I was going to say now um, we have Stevia and monk fruit extract. Or <clears throat> is Stevia monk fruit? I, Stevia is not a fruit. I know that. Okay. Stevia is a leaf. Because monk fruit is apparently, it grows. Yeah. That's a fruit. Yeah. Um, and it's so close to zero. It was approved as zero. Nice. 
because if you're under um <coughs> if you are under a certain amount you're allowed to call yourself zero because like if you sat down and ate a candy or let's just say a candy for example yeah and it says five calories yeah that's nothing no that's that's basically nothing five calories I, I just burned five, more than five. Yeah, just waving your yeah. hands. Oversimplifying, yeah. Yeah, I, you can't see me, but I'm waving. That That's about, probably about five calories, you know. Yeah. So, if the candy said zero, so I think the FDA said if it's under a certain amount, you can say zero because it's basically zero if it has one calorie. Yeah, that's how... You burn um, that opening the wrapper. And that's how celery is, like, yeah. zero calories. Like, yeah. you burn more and chewing and stuff. pickles. Yeah. Because, you, you know, but... You know, do think in mind, it started as a cucumber. Yeah. But if you eat one sliver of a cucumber, cucumbers are very low in calories, so when it's turned yeah. into a pickle, if that's what was pickled, other things can be pickled, obviously. Yeah. You know, that's why it says zero calories. And the stevia plant itself, uh, as just the plant, like the stevia you get in the store is extracted from the plant. The plant itself takes a lot of the plant to really make something sweet. That's probably why it's so expensive, hasn't and, caught um, on. Yeah. I'm honestly surprised well, you can buy bags of it in the store. My parents grew it. Oh, they did, really? Yeah, they grew it. In oh, fact, yeah. in college, I'm leading into that story. She knows what I'm talking about. In college. No, I don't. But no. Okay, so I stayed with my grandparents during college. And a friend, a, a, the son of one of their friends, uh, came over. And he was a little, you know, he was a bit of pothead. And he saw these leaves in the cabinet. Oh, I remember the story now. And he smoked them. <laughs> and he said, dude, your weed is real weak. I'm like, dude, that was stevia. <laughs> he said it did leave a, a, a pleasant aftertaste in his mouth. Like, We don't uh, recommend. Caramel. We do not recommend smoking stevia. There was probably no. health problems that came about due to that. But it was such a small amount that, you know... He was safe, but do not do this at home, well, people. Of course, it tasted vaguely caramely. He basically right? cooked he it. He basically cooked it. <laughs> basically cooked it. Anywho. Yeah. Don't do not recommend. Do not it. recommend smoking stevia. No. Do not do it. But funny anecdote mm. aside, uh, on to our next birthday. Uh, also on February. 10th in 1944 Frances Moore Lapp was born. Uh, she was the author for Diet for a Small Planet in 1971 and she had pseudo vegetarian views but not in the I want to save the animals uh, modern vegetarian views. She put forth the views in her book that raising animals for food was an inefficient use of those resources. Yeah. Which is an I've argument heard, you I've don't heard that argument. Really, do you have? Because I've I know, never okay. heard that argument. Speaking of college, I know someone who said they were vegetarian, but, and they did, it was easier to explain, they said, than saying, and, and we, were, we were discussing it, so she, she didn't lie to me, but it was when just, you know, Someone on the bus would go, oh, hey, how much, you know, how much have you eaten? Or, or you know, just a casual conversation about food. She, yeah. would, she would say she was vegetarian, just kind of sh shut it down. Yeah. Um, and, and explain. She ate chicken and mm -hmm. eggs because they were easier to raise. It takes up less resources, she said, if you, if you do it pound for pound to raise chicken than a pig. She probably read this or book. Or a cow. So she probably read this book. She said that, and and she would just go with vegetarian, mm -hmm. like, and, you know, I'm thinking if she's, like, ordering, and it's like, oh, can you not put bacon on my salad? I'm a vegetarian. Thanks. You know, just because it's easier yeah. than saying, oh, don't put, don't, don't put bacon on my sandwich, um... Because restaurants, waiters are often like, oh, why? Like, or, you know, because they're looking for allergies, yeah. usually. Um, so she would just go, I'm vegetarian. So uh, so mayo's okay. Yeah. Everything else is okay. Yeah. You know. Um, Not that this, this, this particular bit of meat is inefficient to raise yeah. based on our, yeah. you know, uh, so our, our resources. She might have read that book. She might. I want to read this She's book She's the only too. person. Yeah, I want to read that too. I'm curious. <laughs> She's the only person... Whom has said, yeah, I, I, I just kind of put myself in the vegetarian 
yeah. frame for the reasons of raising other animals, beef, pork, yeah, other animals, just takes up so much resources that could be used more efficiently. Yeah. She must have read that book. Yep. So, uh, and the last thing on the tent in 1957, the styrofoam cooler was invented. Uh, it doesn't say styrofoam was invented, just the cooler. So I guess just they figured, well, why don't, you know, it's, it's insulating. Styrofoam That's must have been a thing. Why we made it. Yeah. It must have been uh, I believe thing. it was originally used as an insulator. But I'm not surprised. It's very it's insulating. Very insulating. And you, you know, you shove it with ice and you stick a few beers in there. There you go. <laughs> Styrofoam cooler. I've seen or that. Or other beverages. Or other beverages. Or News, food. Or food. Well, <laughs> yeah. But um, um, beer is one of the first things, uh, alcohol is one of the first things they put in uh, metal uh, cans. Yeah. Which is also oh, insulated. yeah, true. Because, you know. Yeah, it's, it's a good conductor. It's, it's a good conductor. It's a liquid and it. You know, it it has a longer. Actually, shelf life. it's I guess it's a testament to how thin plastic bottles are. Yeah. That you can cool plastic because plastic is not a great conductor. No, but it's not rubber. You thin. know, it is. It still conducts. You know, it's not rubber. If you if they started making rubber bottles. Yeah, that that would that be would be weird. bad because it would not be it would not get cold. No. So it is a testament to how thin they've always made plastic. Mm -hmm. Bottles. Well, it would get cold eventually, but it would take a really long... It would take a lot of energy. Yeah. And melt mostly your ice around it. When did bottled water become popular? I don't know, but I could have an answer for you next episode. Okay. I'm not going to go off and look at it right now, but I can look that up for next episode. I'm sorry, the, the, the cooler just made me think of that. Yeah. When no, did various sense. containers become popular? Because now... You know, water bottles are so thin. Yeah. Sodas in cans. Beer is in cans. Yeah. Wine is in glass. I've seen. Maybe, maybe wine's this is in plastic a, these days too. Oh no, it can be in both. Or it can be, but yeah, a lot of. Maybe this is just a testament to the kind well, of people I hang out with. I've seen cool. I've seen styrofoam coolers of wine. May yeah. You know, maybe that's just me. <laughs> the cardboard, the the wine in cardboard is also in plastic. It's in the plastic bag. The big old no, bag? No, 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 no. Okay. There are little boxes of wine you can get. And the inside yep. is cardboard as well? It's not like tin or anything? Tin foil? It, well, it might be lined, but the idea is it's it's, it's not single serve. It's not. It's yeah. not a juice box. And I'm not advocating excessive drinking, don't get me wrong. But there are now... Similar mm -hmm. to the boxed water, yeah, boxes of wine, huh. little mini. Because the idea is, it's better for the environment. In you, fact, I remember, and I and I won't say the brand. <laughs> I had one, mm -hmm. and I went to drink it, and I and I don't drink as much wine in this kind of. It's it's a great idea. I'm sure this was a malfunction. Yeah, it was open. Oh my! You remember, you came home and you smelled it in the sink. Yeah. And like, what did you? I'm like, I had to pour it out because I noticed the side, mm -hmm. not where you know, cause standing up. Yeah. Fortunately, it didn't tip. Had been open. Oh my. And I don't know for how long. I didn't know. And and I'm I'm sure they've improved. Yeah. I'm sure they've worked on it. And yes, if you want to buy eco packaging, that's cardboard because it was new at the time. It was brand new. Yeah. It was newer. It was newer. I hadn't seen it before, and I tried it. Um, stuff happens. Yeah. Stuff happens. The glue must have loosened, or it hadn't been... I'm sure... Because you, you'd you smell it on the shelf if all of them were open. Yeah. Because I noticed, because uh, I went to... I touched it, and I got a whiff. Mm-hmm. And I'm like... Oh, uh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. And I didn't notice that in the store, but, like, I don't know when it opened. Yeah. And wine keeps... You can keep it, but... Oh, I... It was, I didn't it was a red, risk. wasn't it? I don't remember. It's probably a red because red does keep less when opened, especially like that. I anything and once I go to touch the package and like oh yeah. this has been open I don't know how long. I yeah. don't consume it. Yeah. And it it was a stuff happens moment. I'm not blaming the company. Yep. I totally support eco packaging. Yeah. It, if beer came in cardboard boxes because that's that's the new normal and that's better for the environment. 
I'd be happy as a client. See, the cardboard box, it confuses me because it, you'd think it would leak. you think it would soak through the cardboard. It's got to be lined with something. Or maybe a hydrophobic material or something? Since we Possibly. have those now? We, we also have it, um, adhesives yeah. that are waterproof. Yeah. So if they, you know, in a factory setting, water treat the cardboard. Yeah. With, you know, once it's dry and we know the, the liquid inside does not degrade yeah. the material. You know, because it, like, like box water. Mm -hmm. If it's waterproof and it's yeah. been waterproofed. <laughs> It's waterproof. Yeah. If it's, you know, as long as it's completely dry, what, I, I'm not sure how they do it, but as long as whatever it is is completely dry, completely inert. Yeah. And then they put the water in, it's <laughs> safe. Yeah. You know, and, they, and I'm sure they would use something that is safe to consume if the worst case happened when it, and it did degrade into what you're drinking. You know, these companies know what they're doing. Yeah. But stuff happens. So I would, I would always advocate, you know, there's a reason the side of the package sometimes says, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. anything. If seal is broken, do not consume. Yeah. Yeah. Companies try their best, but if seal is broken, do not consume. And it makes sense. That's that's a disclaimer on any number of any things. Yeah. So, like I said, this is not to insult the company. Yeah. But yeah, I. You're right. I do wonder what they use. Too. No, because we don't have any desktop audio. Yes, or music. you're right. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Sandman just asked me if the desktop <clears throat> should be making any sounds. It should not. It should not. Because we don't have any music. Okay, moving on to the 11th. And we have another birthday in 1926. An incredibly famous French chef, Paul Bocuse. Uh, he's one of the founders of French Nouvelle Cuisine, uh, which has been parodied a lot in media. Uh, it's the, the one with the very small portions, very artfully placed. Uh, the, the real focus of that type of cuisine is actually uh, fresh, ingredi fresh ingredients of very high quality and uh, lighter dishes with a focus on presentation. It's not, you know, two green beans and a swirl of sauce. It's very fresh, very high quality, uh, smaller meals to get away from the huge meals of older cuisines with lots of heavy sauces. Um, this is what really brought in um, high quality butters and oils and whatnot being used as a dressing as opposed to the super heavy sauces like cream sauces and tomato sauces that you see a lot in large portions. Um, so, okay. Well, wasn't the French sauces born of the famine time? They were. So once, so once, once that it's like, ended, okay, yeah. the meat is quality, Yeah. let it shine. Makes yep. sense. Yeah, the meat is quality, the veg is quality. We're no longer, you know, getting what we can and using this meat that's probably a bit older than it should be mm -hmm. and covering that flavor with sauces. But also because that had been going on for so long, it became popular, like any fad. You know, this is what mm -hmm. we're doing, this is now popular. But, uh, so he was one of the big starters of this whole thing. And they used a lot of new uh, kitchen appliances and stuff. In fact, he is one of the uh, most famous first chefs to use a microwave in his restaurant. Really? Yep. Wow. He used a microwave when it came out. He was like, you know, let, let's try this thing. Let's, like, let's see yeah. how it does. And, you know, for the stuff it's good for doing, he would use it. Yeah, I agree. There's nothing wrong there's, with a the microwave. There's nothing wrong with my This guy, named Chef of the Century by the Culinary Institute of America, he is got, you know, chapters about him in culinary textbooks um incredibly famous guy very visionary uh and he used the microwave so people there's nothing wrong with using the microwave if you use it properly true and can i just say before we move on you wrote it cia i was like why the hell would the cia name anyone <laughs> chef of the century culinary instrument see i know that uh th that's what i think when i think cia Whenever someone's like, CIA, open up, I'm like, 
Oh, cool. They're coming to fix my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, Culinary Institute of America. Um, it's a very famous uh, culinary college. It, that, it is. It really is. But when yeah. you type it CIA in all caps, I yep. was like, oh, did they used to influence cooking? <laughs> yep. And um, he actually died, I believe, in 2018. Uh, Paul. Oh, wow. That's... And yeah, it was very recently. Um, mm. Yeah, let me look it up real quick when it was. Because mm. I'm betting he influenced, so I want to say in the 80s, You, I know you said um, two green beans and a little bit of sauce. Yeah. There was a movement of res um, in restaurants of food like that. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you could eat it all in one bite. Yeah. But it was very fancy, so you would go and you'd, and you'd entertain the notion. A lot of that but, was also because yeah. in those places where it was seen as that, it was harder to get the fresher ingredients you wanted. So you would get what small amount of fresh you could. Oh, really? Okay, so it was that. famine again. Yeah, well, sort of. But okay. not, not like super famine. Uh, yes, um, 20th of January in 2018. Uh, he died. So that was incredibly recent. Yeah. Um, his restaurant held three Michelin stars for more than 50 years. And that restaurant was called, I'm probably going to butcher this pronunciation, but the fact having heard it multiple, multiple times, uh, in school, um, L'Auberge de Pont de Colonge. And here's the really interesting bit. He was born in a room above that restaurant in 1926, February 11th. He died in that same room above said restaurant. So he's, he spent pretty much his entire life in that restaurant. That's name I probably butchered because I do not speak a lot of French. Yeah. So, moving on from one incredibly famous French chef to another. Uh, in 1963, Julia Child's The French Chef premiered on... She was French? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if she was French, but she used French cooking techniques. Uh, yeah, I thought she was American. Um, she was born, yeah, in California. Okay, she's American. Well, she's, she's American. allowed to use... Well, She's allowed to use whatever she can use French you know, cooking. title she wants. We, we have to learn from, you know, we learn from the greats. Yeah. You know, and the greats the French the time were great. French. <laughs> French were very great in cooking. And she used a lot of French techniques. So it makes sense that her show would be called The French Chef. Um, it was incredibly popular. It was one of the first cooking shows in America. And it ran from uh, 1963 to 1973 with reruns still being run on multiple stations for decades. Yeah, I bet it's still on the air somewhere. It is. The remaining original episodes, because some were lost, uh, mm -hmm. are available on PBS streaming right now. You can go watch them. Don't leave the oh, stream. Okay. You can go watch them right now, though. <laughs> you can watch them after we're done. After Thank we're you. done. <laughs> go watch some Julia Child. Uh, in fact, um, when Twitch started uh, a cooking section, they ran a marathon of Julia Child's episodes. Oh, wow. So, yeah. How lovely. Uh, the three pilot episodes, which she did eventually d redo later on uh, in different episodes, mm -hmm. and many of the season one episodes were lost, though, uh, due to the fact that um, some recordings were just misplaced, some recordings got recorded yeah. over. Uh, it happened. Back in the day, I mean, most it really of, did. Most it of what really Doctor did. Who early days were lost. I'm honestly that time? surprised. Uh, all of, not to go on a huge tangent, but I'm honestly surprised all of Star mm. Trek mm. is still in one piece. It's a it's a testament to I guess how short the original run was. Yeah, because pretty much every other super famous TV show has missing episodes, and I know yeah. it was a little later, so maybe it was like right after that. But um, also know that the Twilight Zone is lost, None which is Twilight weird to Zone? me. No, I've never heard of the lo of a lost episode of the Twilight Zone. Huh? You know yeah. the first. Uh, so I guess maybe other other than Doctor Who, sci-fi kind of escaped that yeah. somehow. Somehow. 
Uh, the Sorry. first lost episodes, and I'm using the term episodes here loosely, that I can think of are Shakespeare's Lost Folios. Hmm. So it's been a thing that's been going on for, you know, yeah. centuries. Oh, yeah. It, it, it sometimes just happens. We've kind of learned yeah. to keep everything. Yeah, I'm sure there now, was... Now, like, everything is somewhere. I'm sure there was some fiction lost in the Library of Alexandria. Mm-hmm. So, it's a thing that happens. It's unfortunate. But you can go f see all of the remaining episodes on PBS streaming after this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the actual, the, the show first started uh, when Childs was invited to do a cooking demonstration on a different show. I couldn't find the name of the show for some reason. Really? It was probably a variety show that didn't last super, super long. Still, uh, you think the name. Right? The original guest star and the backup guest star both canceled. And wow. uh, she was like their third or fourth choice down. They're like, hey, uh, you, you want to come do your cooking demonstration? And people loved it. And the network was like, get that lady on the air right now. Get her get her cooking some stuff. Um, but the initial budget was so low that they had to recruit volunteers to wash dishes. And they occasionally sold the finished uh, dishes to live the live studio audience. Sold them? Sold them. To you make didn't just get a free money. sample? No. Well, well they might have gotten a free sample. I don't know. Well, because uh, today, I know a lot of cooking shows that have a live audience. Yeah. And, and I know this is, I'm speaking more um, currently. Yeah. Get free samples. Yeah. Um, the, the live audiences are, were probably a lot smaller. And they would get the small, small sample. Enough that you could get some nice shots of the food for later in the episode. But at the end, after the episode was done taping, mm -hmm. they would occasionally try and sell uh, the food to some sense. of the live studio audience to try and make back some money. I know this would have been a little earlier, but there were live audiences for radio shows. Yeah. When you hear people clapping, that was not a clap track. Yeah. That was humans. And um, it's kind of funny when you're listening and, they, and the announcer says the dancers are coming on for a radio show. Yeah, <laughs> right. Because you have to sit there and just like listen to the song. Yeah. But there were people there. Even for radio shows. Watching the dancers. That makes sense. They would want yeah. uh, someone to be, you know, in. Yeah, laugh um, tracks are a more recent up. invention. I know they. I know it's um, still been around for a while, but like the idea of that sound of people laughing or clapping was pre-recorded. Yeah. Is way more recent than you would think. Radio had live. Had like people. And Julia Child's uh, training uh, was pre bucos So she, she didn't learn from Bukos. I was thinking, you know, I, I, I just looked Who? up. Uh, the guy we just talked about, his birthday was in 1926. Okay. Uh, the French Nouvelle Cuisine, the, the smaller portions, all that stuff. And if you watch a lot of Julia Child's stuff, you know that's, that's not her at all. She learned from the previous generation from him, the larger, saucier uh, stuff. Um... So, yeah, that, 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 I just found that sort of interesting that he is so big, but there's so many other big things before him, even these days that people know and still watch. Um, on the 12th of February, uh, Carmela Vitali received a patent for a plastic package saver. And I know a lot of you are probably like, what's a plastic package saver? You know when you get a pizza, and it's got that little triangle table thingy in it? It's that. And that is to keep the box from collapsing inward and marking up the pies. It's used uh, in pieces, but it's also occasionally used and was planned to be used for uh, other kinds of pies and cakes or whatnot. Um, it's most often you see it used in pizzas and fresh cakes and pies because the heat escaping off the mm. product can weaken the cardboard, cause it to sag in. Was that before corrugated cardboard was a thing? Or very common? Uh, 1985. The last time we've ordered pizza, there wasn't a saver in the middle. Which I've, I've kind of noticed lately, and I thought was kind of weird, because when <clears> you know, we were younger, yeah, I, I've seen them. But lately, haven't seen them. So I'm wondering if corrugated cardboard has made them obsolete? 
Uh, no. Corrugated cardboard was apparently invented, uh, patented in 1856. Mm -hmm. It was used as a liner for hats until hats? 1871. Hats? Really? Uh-huh. Huh. Yeah, it just used to, you know, keep your hat propped up. In fact, I think my top hat has corrugated cardboard in it. It might. Now that I think about it. It might. It very well might. But, uh, yeah, corrugated cardboard existed. Uh, we probably have come up with ways to make cardboard more durable over the years. Mm. Uh, just building it up and building it up and building it. But you're right. I haven't seen it in a few yeah, years either. Yeah, I haven't seen it either. And I usually get just a large pizza. Yeah. So that there's more. Yeah. And you would think in the larger pizzas you need it. Yeah, it's like, I, I can't think of in yeah, the last in both five places, years. I can't think of one. We've gotten... A package saver. Yeah. Maybe it has to do with the whole uh, less plastic initiative. Maybe. Maybe, but even before that. Even before that, well, y you start using it and you think you need it, but you keep building up the durability of your cardboard. Yeah. Then, you know, eventually you don't need it, and then the anti-plastic initiative comes along, and you're like, oh no, it's going to mark up all these pizza boxes, but then it doesn't because the plastic's stronger. Not the plastic, the, uh, the, cardboard. the cardboard's stronger. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. Uh, that might be another thing we have to look up, but I I don't even know where you would look for that. Like, yeah, when I don't know did how it you'd stop research that. being uh, popular? I mean, we could look at our, next time we order pizza, we can look at the box and see if it's corrugated or not. Yeah. Because there is some pizza that's not, I'm sure, comes in a, you know... The, just the single layer of cardboard. Yeah, and you think that but would be more likely to collapse. It definitely. But we'll see. Uh, maybe we'll order a pizza tonight for all of you and, <laughs> you know, put down in the comments. We'll, we'll do our that. research. Do our research <laughs> ourselves. Um, this must be researched. Uh, that's the only reason I want to order pizza. The, the only reason. The only. Not that pizza's delicious or anything. No, no. Um, no. <laughs> on the 13th, of February in 1923, uh, Joseph Rosefield received a patent for a method of manufacturing peanut butter that prevented the oils from separating out. This created the first shelf-stable peanut butter that could stay fresh for up to a year. Uh, which it, is very important when you want to sell the stuff, yeah. you know, after immediately. Yeah. Uh, he first licensed it to another company that made Peter Pan peanut butter until 1932 when his own company began marketing their own Skippy peanut butter. Which ironically, late, which later they made a more natural one that separated. I've seen it. Have you? <laughs> yeah, I've seen oh, Skippy funny. that you have to stir. <laughs> Skippy classic. <laughs> Pretty much. Well, because everyone then went in our, on an organic kick, a less, a less processed kick. Yeah. It, I'm not saying it's wrong either way. But there is more ingredients in the peanut butter that you don't have to stir. There's more salt. There's, there's yeah. more oil that isn't peanuts. If you just take peanuts, and which we've made peanut butter, actually. We have. And you grind them up in a blender, it creates peanut butter, but it separates. Yeah. What did we make those peanut butter, that peanut butter for? Was that cookies? It's a holiday party. It was a holiday party? Yeah. We oh, okay. peanut butter and peanut butter bread to one of your holiday parties. Yes, and we didn't have any peanut butter. So like, we're just going to make our own peanut butter. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun, and it was delicious. And it was really good. Peanut butter bread is really freaking good. Yeah, I gotta make that again. I gotta find that recipe again. It's a, it was an older recipe, but yeah, ironically, I've seen Skippy that separates. Yeah, it was uh, one of the um, the Depression era recipes, wasn't it? In that cookbook you had? No. No. Well, I never got a cookbook, but maybe. From the library. Or no, was it was that lady online? Yeah, it was online. It was oh, online. I don't. I, I gotta look it up. Yeah. I gotta. I just gotta Google peanut butter bread. I'm sure I bookmarked it. Yeah. Because it was a good recipe. It was a very good recipe. Very tasty. Yeah. It was um, very good. moving on to Valentine's Day, February fourteenth, which is also Trifon Zarazin Day in Bulgaria. Um, Trifon Zarazin was a saint, and is the patron saint of vineyards in Bulgaria. Uh, it's the first day people go out and work in the vineyards. Uh, vines are pruned, and then they are sprinkled with wine from the previous year, and blessed to bring a good harvest in the next year. 
It's uh, one of the oldest customs known in the Bulgarian folk calendar. Due to the Gregorian and Julian calendar differences, the church celebrates the day on the 1st. It also probably helps them do Valentine's Day Masses and whatnot, separate from their Trifanzerazen Day Masses. Um, but the people of Bulgaria celebrate it on the 14th. The traditional dish is bread, uh, usually a circular bread as a symbol of uh, fertility, and roasted chicken stuffed with rice. Generally, it's a whole roasted chicken, uh, and the rice is cooked in the chicken, but we're actually thinking of making that next year, mm -hmm. just because it sounds delicious. It does sound really nice. So, a stuffed chicken breast. Yep, just a with stuffed rice. chicken breast. Because I, uh, Stuffing a chicken breast is a lot easier than roasting a whole chicken in a home oven, especially mm -hmm. these days. Um, in 1773, on Valentine's Day, uh, February 14th, uh, is Benjamin Delassert's birthday. It's but a lot like dessert, which is ironic considering he would go on to develop the first successful procedure to extract sugar from sugar beets. Uh, the end product is near identical to cane sugar. But vegetarians prefer beet sugar due to its natural white color, not, necess not necessitating the bleaching by charred bone used for the naturally more yellow cane sugar. So there are also, uh, chefs claim that there's some flavor differences and whatnot. Uh, I'm sure there is. I I'm sure there is. But according to chemical analysis, mm -hmm. cane sugar and uh, processed, processed cane sugar, fully processed, and fully processed beet sugar is chemically identical. So that there being melting point and flavor differences is a bit odd, but believe it, we don't know everything about you know chemistry yet. We don't know the the whole breakdown of exactly everything. And with plant stuff like this, every single grain is different mm -hmm. in you know little tiny ways. Yeah. Uh, but be. Because the refining process for beet sugar does not create molasses, brown beet sugar has cane molasses, cane sugar molasses, added. Because molasses is a byproduct of the refining of cane sugar. And that's what brown sugar is, is you add the molasses back into the white cane sugar, or beet sugar. Or you mm -hmm. could probably create um, any kind of molasses, you could probably create a false uh, 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 non-sugar based sweetener uh, molasses might be a bit you mean like an artificial rate. yeah well no because it would still use you mean cook cane an artificial molasses um i don't know why you would want to but you probably could well yeah. just you know, you know scientifically who smoked stevia speaking. good I mean, point i guess we, we could try it that could be an interesting video. One, it could, one, time. <laughs> one time we, like, we're making a... Uh, we try to make molasses from artificial sweetener. Splenda molasses. It might work. I it, don't know. My, I don't like Splenda. Oh. Well, we don't have to eat it. True. <laughs> not molasses. Brown sugar. I, but I, I haven't like seen it on the market. I honestly have not. Yeah. You would think if it was doable, yeah. it would be in the store on the shelf. Yeah. Because people do. People, you know, like honey, but want to go on a diet. Yeah. So, you know, where's the artificial zero-calorie honey? Yeah. Where it, or caramel or molasses, you know, cooked artificial. Uh, obviously, artificial honey would be completely artificial. Yeah. But if, if it was doable in a syrup form. Yeah. You know, I, I've never seen stevia syrup on a shelf. I have. You Actually, have stevia I've, I've syrup. seen a uh, liquid stevia. Yeah, I've never seen that. Yep. Uh, okay. Syrups are easier to do than uh, a molasses would be because molasses. Is, is that not similar though? No, uh, molasses is made from the refining process of cane sugar, whereas a syrup is further refining the sugar by adding it to uh, some water and just boiling it down into a okay. gooey liquid. But they are very similar. In flavor, sort of. In consistency, at least. In consistency, yes, they are near identical in well, consistency. Well, obviously, um, 
when you when you process stevia, if it doesn't make a molasses, then it doesn't make a molasses. Yeah. I'm talking about a, um, something made for sale. So yes, if they can make stevia liquid, then yes, that's what I'm talking about. Well. So then yes, I, I get they're not exactly the same. But yes, if you can make molasses stevia is a syrup. very distinct flavor, and well, you true. wouldn't be able to make a molasses out of anything but sugar cane. Uh, you could make a syrup out of any other kind of sweetener. It's making a brown sugar using cane molasses mm -hmm. added to another sweetener that would be interesting to see. Um, mm -hmm. It would be usable by vegetarians and vegans because mm -hmm. it's not until the sugar is granular that the charred animal bone is used to bleach it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have the, that same... So molasses is vegan? Uh, as far as I'm aware, yes. It... Based on what I know, out yeah, it's taken out before, before that, step. that step. Okay. They might have a problem with molasses because they know it is eventually going to go on to that step. Though there is now uh, sugar that doesn't do that. Um, but I, I, I don't know. But so happy birthday, Benjamin Delassert, uh, on Valentine's Day. That name just—it's it, so serendipitous. It, it, yeah, it's so close. It is so close. It's two letters off. It has an extra E and an L in there from yeah. dessert. And it, he made another kind of sugar. I, it is so close. It's I hilarious. just find that funny. Uh, also on the 14th, in 1871, Thomas Adams, uh, not the U.S. president, that's Tom Adams. Adam? Adams? I don't know. When I was doing research, there was a... Ah, yes. Uh, received a patent for a method of producing chewing gum. Uh, he was originally attempting to formulate the natural gum chicle, which is often chewed uh, in Central and South America for centuries, into a rubber suitable for tires. But he failed. And since people have been chewing it for ever, he's like, all right, well, just put it in your mouth, I guess. Hey, he's not, we talked about the guy who invented chewing gum. So I guess this was just a new process. Uh, yes. We talked about him... Maybe it was his birthday. Uh, no. In, in a previous, previous episode, episodes. we talked about the inventor of chewing gum. So this I is just another method. I don't remember who was the same guy. It was another method. It was a... Patented a method for producing chewing gum. Specifically what all the articles said. Uh, not that he made the original chewing gum and you know chewing a natural gum mm -hmm. it, it's been around for centuries so even the guy that produced the didn't we talk about the guy that produced bubble gum not chewing gum oh maybe that's the difference that might be the difference that might be because the difference. it's a different uh yeah it thing. would be different chemical yeah they they sell it in different packages even today yeah yeah you wouldn't try to blow bubbles with a chewing gum you wouldn't be very successful if you did no in 1922, the Fleischmann Company registered their trademark for yeast, uh, though they have been producing it since 1876. So, technically, happy birthday Fleischmann's yeast, mm -hmm. but you've been doing it for years before that. Um, well, everyone had been making yeast. I'm surprised they got a patent. I'm guessing they must have done it very, very specifically. Yeah. Uh, because every beer, when you brew a beer, makes yeast, period. It does, but it took us a while to figure that out. True. And making very just true. yeast itself to make yeast mm -hmm. instead of using it immediately. Oh, they don't make a beer and no. then make the yeast? Uh, I just kind of, I just always kind no, of envisioned just... any yeast company had a beer that they just kind of threw out or rebranded. No, not that. how else do you make yeast? I'm not entirely sure. They, they, yeast is a living organism. They might just yeah. breed it. Just breed, 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 breed yeast. Right, but that's how you breed it, right? Yeah, that's, that's what I always thought, is no. you make a beer, because, yeast is the byproduct. No, because the yeast dies in the beer. You well, add If you yeast. leave it in. If you leave it in, yeah. And it's, you know, it's actually really difficult to get out uh, once you've bottled them uh, and you only get a very small amount. You can breed yeast just through sugar. I use, uh, you use yeast for baking all the time. 
uh, leavening, stuff like that. Right. And the yeast breeds when you're baking and whatnot. So... Yeah, beer is... Bread is... Mm. Yeah, beer is pretty much liquid bread. Uh, technically, it's also alcoholated. Not alcoholated. What kind of word is that? I don't know. Uh, they, it produces alcohol from the sugar that the yeah, yeast that they is, digest. is fed. Uh, I, because you don't kill the yeast as fast. But say I just you kind of figured they made less beer or marketed it. Because no. the fermentation creates yeast, <laughs> and then you harvest it. You don't let it mm. sit long enough to stop producing. Fermentation doesn't create yeast. Yeast creates fermentation. It's the other way around. I thought it was both ways. Nope. Yeast, I thought it was a cycle. Yeast pretty much farts alcohol. Yes. They, they, they take in sugar and they fart alcohol. Yes. And so if you keep feeding them sugars, they will breed a lot, and then you can skim... Yeast yes. out, dry it, cake it, like Fleischmann's is known for, or preserve it in a way, and then sell it. Uh, I don't know what Fleischmann's does with the leftover alcohol production. Yeah, because it has to produce alcohol. It has to, because that's what yeast that, does. You, you just confirmed what I was thinking, is they, it's a cycle, but yes, yeah. at the end of the day, it produces an alcoholic substance. Yeah, the, the, the sugar. So they're making a beer and harvesting the yeast instead of prioritizing the beer, they're prioritizing a different part of the process. Although, actually, I was wrong, no. Yeast doesn't exactly spread alcohol, it breaks down into carbon dioxide. The sugars break down into both alcohol and carbon dioxide. I have not... Well, that's how it's carbonated. It is. Um, they do both. They do both. I've not studied yeast in a while. It might produce a lot more carbon dioxide than does alcohol. And the... I don't know, because then how are beers, but then how is bread not, because you kill it off soon enough that... Well, because you cook bread. Because remember, I used to make a sourdough starter, right? And I yeah. started with yeast, and it would, it would ferment. And I warned you, you are fermenting yeah. the starter. The starter is fermented. So it produced both alcohol so and So once I put dioxide. it in the bread and put it in the oven, then the alcohol cooks out. But when you're making... A bread, pseudo quickly, not a quick bread, because that's a completely different thing that doesn't use yeast, it uses chemical yeah. leavening. Yeah, um, there is no alcohol in it. Although I'm sure it, my sourdough starter very though, small had alcohol. Amounts of very small. Alcohol would cook off. So it yeah. produces more carbon dioxide, which is used to leaven the bread. Mm. That's also a lot when the yeast are dying. Mm -hmm. I have to do my yeast research again. Yeah, maybe next episode on yeast. It has been a while <laughs> since I've researched yeast, and I don't have all the information still up in my noggin. But in 1922, on Valentine's Day, the Fleischmann Company registered their trademark for yeast. Not any kind of alcohol, just yeast. Mm. And we're going to find out why next episode. That's yeah. what? Two things this episode we have to look up for next episode? Yes. That, we're on a roll. <laughs> Uh, in 1923, a year later, on the same day, the Velveeta Cheese Company splits off from the Monroe Cheese Company. Hmm. Uh, but the Monroe Cheese Company's cheese maker, Emile Frey, uh, they just opened another plant elsewhere, and that made mostly Swiss, but other kinds of cheese. But due to some problems, there were a lot of broken wheels that they couldn't sell and cast off bits so he would take them and experiment with them mm -hmm. and one of these experiments produced Velveeta yeah because Velveeta is a mix of cheeses yeah we always yeah that you know it's that a, was not a hidden from the consumer um, it's a mix of cheeses to make a good melting mix yep and a flavor mix yep and so these yeah, days there's always, a lot less yeah. actual cheese in there they've Shorten the production process of it. They've oh, made yeah, it yeah. a lot there's, easier and these days it has to be called a cheese product Yeah, there is a huge I, I worked in a deli briefly. Yeah, and there is There is a difference between cheese and cheese product. Yep, and it's still food. We're yeah. not saying it's not food We're not saying it's not edible. It's but just there, a it, distinction. It's a classification Yeah, of how long it's been I, I'm not how long it's I guess it's been processed yeah I don't know cheese um, product is quicker to make but it is still milk it is still dairy it is still yeah. perfectly valid food 
but the FDA has a certain, I think the F, I think it's the FDA again, no. a certain classification on what can be called, you know, what you put the time into to be yeah. cheese versus the, versus, you know, you stop the process sooner and it's product. Yeah. Um, so it was originally a lot more cheese than it is, mm -hmm. but it was originally a lot of cheese and now it's not as much cheese. So, um, they split off in 23. On the 15th of February, uh, yesterday in, in uh, 1758, Benjamin Jackson uh, advertised mustard for sale for the first time in America. Uh, the advertisement claimed Jackson was the first and only manufacturer of mustard in America. We haven't found any... Other advertisements advertising mustard at that time, so he may have been, but people could have been making, you know, uh, mustard elsewhere and just not advertise that specifically. He just, he, he saw the opportunity to be like, hey, I have this thing that I don't see advertised anywhere else. Come and get it. Mm -hmm. So, and then on to today, the 16th of February. International Pancake Day. So enjoy your pancakes. International Pancake Day. That's what it said. International Pancake Day. So this time Charmed and Hordak can enjoy their pancakes too. Yeah. So, uh... How lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you find out it was International Pancake Day? Uh, during my research on Today in who, Culinary History. Who decides if it's international or not? Uh, apparently a panel somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I would assume. Like, that, that's, a, you see that a lot everywhere. It's international this day, it's international that day, and every I day is like... I usually see it's national this, that, or this day, not international. See, I've seen a lot of both. Mm. You see usually, international. It's you like, see oh, it's national, national see... chocolate day. It's national yeah. margarita day. It's national this well, day. It's a lot easier to get the people in a nation together and be like, yeah, sure, why not? Chocolate's cool. I'm pretty sure there's all just one guy who makes this all up probably but like getting the 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 one guy from each nation together i mean <laughs> they got to go out for drinks they get a bit drunk they forget what they're doing and then the, at the end of the night they got to be like oh yeah right it's international uh pancake day where's the nearest ihop <laughs> there you go so which is the international house of pancakes it is maybe they decided it's international pancake day <laughs> probably because apparently they can call an IHOP manager. <laughs> One of the IHOP managers just decided. It's like, today. It's the day. What day, sir? International Pancake Day. Send a memo. Send a memo out to all our stores. <laughs> How late were you up last night, sir? Speaking of fast food joints, uh, in 1909, on this day, uh, Richard McDonald was born. So happy birthday, Richard, Richard McDonald. Uh, he was one of the brothers who founded McDonald's Restaurant, which they later sold to Ray Kroc. Uh, he was the one who designed the iconic Golden Arches, so he was the artist of the family. Hmm. So, Interesting. Happy birthday, Richard McDonald. And speaking of hamburgers, in 2009, our most recent bit of culinary history until the next bit, which is actually news, uh, a truck carrying frozen hamburger patties hit the center median and dumped thousands of pounds of burgers onto I-15 near Salt Lake City, Utah. As if that was not bad enough, a few hours later, a truck again carrying thousands of pounds of fat tire beer did the same on I-84, also in Utah. So bad day for Utah roads, Yeah. Uh, February wow. 16th, 2009. Um, that was that, a lot wow. of cleanup there. Yeah. Oh my, I, I pity Oof. Ohio road crews. In yeah. February 16, 2009, my hat, if I was wearing it right now, it goes off to you, sir. Dude, that would have flooded. It would have flooded. The liquid one would have flooded. The Four. hamburger, at least, even as it thawed, would have stayed relatively put. 40,000 pounds of hamburger? Uh, still, still, it, it's a, it's a solid. Mm -hmm. Even as it thaws, it's a solid. And anyone driving Flooding behind is, those trucks, oof. oh my god. Yeah, I hope everyone was okay. Uh, 
I didn't look that much into it because I didn't want to find out they weren't. No. I wanted this to be a whimsical little news story about it's very, it's very whimsical. burgers and beer. Yeah, they, they had a yeah. party. They right? had a party. <laughs> they went over it. They're like, we hope. Hey. We no. hope. Oh, so uh, yeah. Anyone injured on that day? I'm sorry for you. That yeah. oh, that is crazy. Um, I'd like to continue thinking that was a rather whimsical event, but you're right. It probably was not. So. It is, it is a coincidence that two yeah. food trucks of any... Of any kind. Would, yeah. Carrying like both practically uh, in on the, the same, same state. road, yeah. Yeah. Uh, though, for those of you in Europe that are wondering how I-84 and I-15 can both be in Utah, um, the even numbers go uh, diagonally, not mm -hmm. diagonally, uh, vertically across the country. Whereas the odd numbers go horizontally mm -hmm. across the company. So 15 and 84 can be near each other. Yes. Uh, due Very to Utah's... Well, yeah, they're both, both in Utah. They probably cross at some point. Oh, I'm, sh I'm um, certain. Due to the I'm way most do. interstates Because it's work. I, yeah. Yeah. The interstate. So it's an interstate. Utah is one of the middle states. 15 yeah. would go, you know, all the way across the country. Uh, and it most likely would cost 84 which mm -hmm. goes up and down mm -hmm. uh, at some point. <clears throat> so, yeah. hopefully uh, the, that, that wasn't where they hit. Although if it was, that probably would have been mentioned in the article. Um. Oh, yeah, if they <laughs> had been on the same stretch of road, yeah, would have been in the article. The fact that it's in the same day is newsworthy. In fact, if it had been on the same stretch of road, uh, they would have run one over the other because that's usually how large highways like that work is one goes under, one goes over. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, you know, having stoplights and all that. Yeah. Um, and the road crews, they must have just... Uh, worst day of work ever for Utah road yes. crews. <laughs> definitely. And worst probably day ever for people near those trucks. So hats off to you folks. And onwards to uh, new news, because there is some new culinary news this past week. Um, Egypt uh, finds what may be the world's oldest mass production brewery. Uh, according to Fizz.org, a joint Egyptian-American team led by Matthew Adams of New York University and Deborah Veschik of Princeton uncovered a more than 5,000-year-old brewery at a funerary site in North Abydos, Egypt. Uh, Abydos is an incredibly old uh, archaeological site in Egypt, a huge city, and one of the largest archaeological, you know, areas uh, in the world. It's on par with Pompeii for digs. It's on par for, uh, with all these other, like, huge names. Um, a lot of tombs have been found near there, and, you know, incredibly important archaeological site. It's believed to have been founded during the time of King Narmer, who unified Upper and Lower Egypt, beginning what's known as the First Dynasty of Egypt. He was the first big pharaoh of both sides of Egypt as a single nation. References to the site were uncovered by British archaeologists in the early 20th century, but it was not found until now, which, you know, tells you how huge the archaeological site is. Um, the brewery is laid out in eight large areas, each with 40 earthenware pots, and it's believed they produce just under 23,000 liters of beer at a time. Much of it was used for rituals and the royalty. Uh, ironically, my favorite, uh, those of you that have heard me talk about sci-fi, my favorite sci-fi series, Stargate, heavily featured the planet known as Abydos, uh, based on the city of Abydos, because aliens stole ancient humans, uh, from various points in the series. Mm. Um, those people had been taken from ancient Egypt, probably around the city of Abydos, based on the planet name being the same, by the alien Ra, uh, and it was the first alien planet seen in the series, in the movie Stargate in 1994, that started the franchise. 
ironically, uh, they greeted the people of Earth that came through the Stargate with alcohol. It was like the first thing they did upon, mm -hmm. you know, meeting the delegation from Earth that came through the Stargate when they, they found the city over the ridge. They're like, oh, come in, here's, here's this beer. Mm -hmm. And now we find the actual ancient city upon which the base is an absolute powerhouse in ancient beer production, which I find super That is funny. super interesting. And, and mm -hmm. uh, funny, yes. From Ironic, the funny, interesting. Like, from the standpoint of the show, yes. There's, there's no way they could know. No, there's how would they no know? The snow would have known. They just found. Although the there, there might have been some documents or something. Yeah, like I said, in the early twentieth uh, century, uh, which is also when the movie says the Stargate was found, mm -hmm. uh, in a, in the same area as uh, Abydos, actually, um, because that's where Ra ruled from was in mm -hmm. that area. Uh, so there was the references to the site, but they didn't know exactly where. Yeah. Now they have, and it's. You know, yeah. It's very prominent and uh, believed to be, you know, a large part of what this area of the city was for. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but, you know, there's no way with just references to a site of a brewery. Yeah, true. That, that they, know, would they know could know exactly that, where. That's true. That, that exactly where, or that it's the, the oldest mass produced yeah. and lo rather large uh, brewery in history. Mm -hmm. Like,. Finding a reference to a brewery, you could be like, oh, okay, it's a, it's a few huts that, you know, make some, some beer. Like the oldest uh, restaurants, well, Egypt pseudo did, restaurants. We knew Egypt had a lot of beer production. Yeah. We knew they did. We knew they did. But this is... We just didn't know exactly where. Further back. You know. <clears throat> and, um, you know, beer, beer is big. Beer but has always a, been a big. A mass production... It has. But a mass production brewery is something just completely different from what you see anywhere else. It would be, you know, a few a few houses that make beer. Mm -hmm. Like, we have a brewery right up the road. I wouldn't call them mass production. No. But, in, but in Egypt, they might have called that, you know, two house-sized areas. But Quite this possibly. But this is eight large areas, each with 40 barrels of beer each. That That's is a lot for those huge. days. That is huge for those days. For those days. But, you know, like I said, beer has always been big. Beer so has always I been big. So the idea that it, it would have been in text that this city made beer. Mm -hmm. You can't tell me nobody mentioned it. Yeah. You know, you find an ancient newspaper, there's, if, um, you know, a newspaper from today. Yeah. Ages, you know, it was found ages from now. Yeah. When it's ancient. Yeah. To put it in perspective, because that's what happens. Is yeah. People are living their everyday lives. Oh, I went to the Ad, um, Abydos. You, the Abydos tasting room. Mm -hmm. It was great. Yeah, you know, that it. You know, it's probably something someone found that a review. You know, today would be online, but in those days, might have been in the paper. Yeah, you can't tell me they. I mean, well, maybe not though. Would they have had average everyday people maybe talking about their experiences in a newspaper, or is that? Seeing as Super how more recent. Uh, we believe much of this beer was used for rituals in the royalty, the average everyday people would not. Okay. Uh, but, you know, a king or two. Mm. A pharaoh, sorry. Yes, pharaoh. Or minor nobility or whatever, or two. You know, it might be interesting to try and contact um, the people behind Stargate. Although, the people behind Stargate now. Oh, boy. Mark. Hi, bud. Uh, there's one more news article, bud. Don't... Oh, no. Too late. It's too late. It's too late. Um, Come here, Mother. Our stream ender has... <laughs> our, has community our community manager, Mr. Monarch, manager, has officially uh, stated we have been streaming for too long. We have. It's actually been our longest culinary history podcast. And it's um, too long. Apparently it is. <laughs> hi, bud. He so, says hi. It might be interesting to... Uh, attempt to contact the people behind the historical side of Stargate and see how much they knew. Yeah. About... Because there had to be the, some reference to it. There had to be something written yeah. somewhere. There were references to the site uh, discovered in the early 20th century. So mm -hmm. they might have really known exactly how important beer was and that that was a subtle nod in. Just like the whole uh, mm -hmm. Egypt is really easy to learn once you figure out the vowels from Dr. Daniel Jackson. 
Right, because which is true. It, it's true because we're not we, saying it's we easy. We haven't figured but out ancient Egyptian because they never wrote down the vowels. Yeah, <laughs> that that's that's the whole nod there. So they they're known for throwing in uh, really very, subtle, yeah, very historic, uh, historic references there yeah. that are really. So good. my guess is there was references <laughs> because so. We know so much about Egypt because we found so much writing. Yeah. And we were fortunate enough to be able to decipher the writing. Yeah, even if we have issues with the spoken really, word. Um, especially we were very the lucky tombs. how much we found preserved yeah. Yeah. written. So who knows? Maybe we found an ancient Yelp review. Yeah. For yeah. um uh Abydos. Abydos beer. Yeah. We, we might have found an ancient Yelp review. We might have. You know, uh, uh, and in our last article, before Monarch really <laughs> insists that we stop, in an article from Ozzy.com, uh, Thomas Bilgeman, a Dutchman living in Ho Chi Minh, Vietnam, is rescuing many beers uh, that were destined for dumpsters after lockdowns leave them sitting on shelves past their six-month sell-by dates. Uh, he mashed them together and distilled them into gin. Uh, he would buy out-of-date beers from brewers and stores, make the company make back money that they thought they, you know, lost completely, and then distilling the brews with juniper berries and Vietnamese kumquats uh, to make a sweet drink with a much longer shelf life that he can then sell uh, and make some money back himself. Mm. He has half a decade of brewing experience behind him and distillers in his family history uh, making his brewstillery, as he calls it, um, idea really flourish. Uh, mashed up craft gin, it's called, and his brewstillery team hoped to bring this trend into more common use out of mm. necessity. Uh, from you know, in yeah, starts in necessity, bring it into common use because you know people are liking it. People are I like. I get it. Why waste? Because uh, yeah. I understand everything needs to have a shelf life. Yeah. I get that. And I get that it's it's better overall, but there are certain things. Yeah. And there's ways you can And there are ways to... Because I'm sure... Because we all know, or, or maybe we don't all know, so I'll say it, distilling kills germs. Yeah. So taking the beer, if anything had grown in it, and redistilling it would clean it. Would clean it. And I'm oversimplifying, liquor. but it would clean it. Liquor has a much longer shelf life than beer. Very true. So he, he's making this sellable for a, a much longer time. And the article... Safely. Uh, it, safely is, it is drinkable. It is very drinkable. And apparently it's very good. People are really buying it out. Um, Don't recommend it, trying this at home, though. No. It, unless you really know what you're doing. and Making have, alcohol, making liquor that strong of an alcohol at home... Can Don't be un can be very unsafe. Do not do it. Buy your beer, drink your beer, enjoy your beer. This guy's a professional brewer and mm -hmm. distiller. In fact, making beer at home is easier and safer than making liquor. Yeah. Don't I don't recommend trying to make liquor at home. No, this guy is a. You professional. get an at home beer kit. Follow the instructions. You'll know there are less at, or none actually at home liquor kits. Yeah, not that I've seen. Yeah, this, this not guy's that I've a. Seen. Professional distiller. Mm -hmm. He so knows what he's doing. do not try this doing. at home. And if you want to try to make beer at home, get a kit, follow the instructions. Yeah. Do it right. Do it safe. Learn what you're doing. And, you know, be, be happy with it. You know, make yourself some good beers. But yeah, this guy, he, he knows what he's doing. He brews it with uh, juniper berries and Vietnamese kumquats. Uh, and... He pretty much creates a base that he already knows how to make instead of using fresh barley and all the stuff that already goes into beer. He takes the, you know, would-be tossed beers and uses them instead. So which this is, guy... Which, because he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. Is a great idea. So... Because I... There has been a lot of waste <coughs> in these times. Yeah. It's and, unfortunate. And uh, unfortunately, yeah, there has been a lot of waste and lack of production. Yep. But there also has been a lot of waste. Yeah. Because this kind of hit everyone everywhere. Yeah. By surprise. So yeah. people were stocked up and ready to go normally. Businesses, you know, were stocked up ready to go normal. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, it's not normal. So, um, 
Thomas Billsman, Mashed Up Craft Gin. Uh, if you get a chance to try, if you're down in Vietnam, give this guy a shot. Give his stuff a shot, and when hopefully... When it's safe to travel. When it's safe. Well, if you're already in Vietnam, then it's safe to go out, then yeah. And after that, you know, he's probably still going to keep making it. Because even with everything being normal, there's still stuff that gets tossed out. So if there, he gets the there, chance... Yes, there are plenty of food waste, unfortunately, in all systems, even when they're working normally. Yeah. So he's probably going to keep making this, and um, he, he wants to keep making this. He wants to keep his brew stillery, as he calls it, going, and bring it into a new trend uh, that continues on. And, you know, if it ever makes its way up here, I look forward to giving I think it a shot it's myself. A, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> it is. On a professional level. Yeah. You know, like the you brewery know. up the road knows what they're doing. If yep. they had said, hey, we, what do you call it, brewstillery? Yeah. They had a brewstillery line. I would trust them. I wouldn't do it myself, but I would trust a professional. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that is our sweet culinary history podcast for today. Mm-hmm. A lot of sugar mm-hmm. related stuff. Ironically yep. enough, for this particular week. Um, we will see you again in two weeks. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Yeah, thank you for watching. Have a good Have night. Have a good night.